Hi, this is Del Hungerford coming back. Uh, this is the final session of the uh, 2019 gathering. Somehow the video didn't get recorded during the session, so I came home immediately and decided to go ahead and put that session in a Zoom thing from here, the comfort of my own living room. And you may see a cat or two. That's okay, I talked about it through the entire conference anyway, so you might get to meet some of my creature features. But I wanted to get this done quick so I'd remember what I'd said on the last day. Uh, so with that, I'll screen share here in a minute and then you'll be able to see my PowerPoint presentation and we'll go from there. But my portion in talking about the new move of God is really a lot about what is going to propel us into that next thing that is going on. I mean, for every move of God that has come along, there have been people that have participated, there have been people that have sat and watched, there have been people who have said, what is that? And there's different levels of understanding, participation, whatever. Our goal in Northwest Ecclesia and I know mine personally, is, is to help us get what we need so that we can function, fully function, in this new move. Because as we move from one age to the next, there's more responsibility. Uh, so on that note, I think I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna start this little slide presentation. Hopefully we don't get a cat who decides he wants to chew on the computer screen. Okay, now I need to move this so I can put this down. We're going to start the slideshow. We're going to start it from the beginning. And I like cool slideshows. So the curtain is drawn and here we go. So this presentation, I'm going to move my thing so I can actually, where's my picture? Okay, what we see in each move that we've had, so we're gonna take a look a, a little bit, excuse me, a little look at some historical aspects of this as we move through this slide presentation. Every move of God comes as something new, like a toy to play with. And I'll explain how that works. With all things new, we experiment. You give a kid a toy, He's going to take it apart, he's going to roll it around, he's going to throw it around the room, he might not necessarily treat it right, unless he's taught from the beginning. Every, it's natural to experiment with things. There's always a certain amount of grace during the learning process. I mean, after, you know, we work with the two-year-old and saying, okay, you, this is how you use it, and they mess up a couple times, but there comes to be a point in their growth where they need to be responsible for the information that they've been given so that they know how to take care of that new toy. So once we reach a higher level of maturity, we become more responsible for what we know. If, for example, during the time where the move of God was really moving into praying in tongues and understanding what that was, sure, we understand it, we get it, but then if we never do anything with it, we haven't matured in that process and we become responsible for knowing okay this is here you've practiced it now use it just like real life eventually there are consequences for our actions so for example just like i said if you you introduce the baptism of the holy spirit you pray in tongues you've done it a few times and then you haven't done it then there are consequences that come with that and they're not necessarily always negative consequences in this case it's just going to be there's not going to be as much revelation so if you want more revelation in your life or as i should say if i want more revelation in my life i just know that i need to keep at something in order for that to come to pass each movement is to propel us into deeper intimacy with god and how that happens is completely up to us and now we get to take a walk down history lane. The term dump and run, we heard that throughout the conference, and I thought that was really funny when I heard that because it is so true. The term dump and run is the typical style of imparting information by leaders to the people. We see this in conferences. 
you go and you spend days on end sitting there just listening and by the time you're done your mind is just like i'm ready to explode yes your spirit receives that information but if you don't go home and do something with it all you've done is had a dump and then you've run um this style of presentation puts minimal emphasis on purple rev personal revelation and responsibility church leaders have fostered the hierarchy system as a means of taking care of the people for example when you're sick oh i can't wait till i get to church on sunday so i can have the elders pray for me or man i really really need this in my life i'll just go forward in church on sunday and have and have the intercessors pray for me or i'll i'll get on facebook and contact all the intercessors and say please pray for me those are all forms of having somebody else do for us what we should be doing for ourselves and but unfortunately, that's what we've been taught to do. So we do it. So the relationship focus in Dump and Run is more on a leader to the people rather than the people directly relating to God. This is no different than Moses going to God for the people instead of the people each individually going directly to God themselves. As a son of God, we have the responsibility of taking care of our own issues. We don't need an intercessory prayer team or a pastor to take care of our issues. It's great when they can come alongside us and agree, but that should not be our main go-to method of dealing with stuff. Moves of God in the last few years. We're continuing down history. Charismatic renewal in the 1970s when speaking in tongues came back to the forefront. I heard, first heard this in sixth grade. My Sunday school teacher got up there and she goes, I just got the gift of tongues. And she goes, let me see if I can do it. And I remember sitting there waiting for about five minutes and all of a sudden she started praying in tongues. And we're like, wow, this is cool. And we didn't know what to do with it. And then I didn't actually become spirit filled until some seven or eight years later. Again, she was playing with it just like we all do with new things. People don't necessarily know what to do which was the case here. Intercessory prayer and healing ministries also became really popular in the 1970s. And as I shared, I remember sitting around in the church and everybody sat in a circle and they're like, okay, what are you sensing or feeling that we need to pray for? And then somebody like, well, I'm getting, it was during fair season. I'm getting a vision of the Ferris wheel. And then there's a cog that's about ready to come out and it could come crashing down. So I remember us all praying into that and, you know, putting the cog back in and just releasing whatever it was and praying so that nobody would be hurt. I, I don't know why, but I mean, that was a bazillion years ago, but I remember that incident. The Word of Faith movement began in the 1980s. This would be Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland. Deliverance Ministries also took off like gangbusters during this time. I mean, there was a demon under every corner. I remember when I first went to college, I joined a church that... Every Sunday, they would sit everybody down and say, okay, what, what deliverance can we do in you today? And they make you cough or puke or do something. And I'm like, okay, this is really dumb. <laughs> I, and I eventually, since that's what happened every Sunday, I just said, I don't want any part of this. The Word of Faith movement, really, because I was in the Word of Faith movement, there is nothing wrong with it. But what happened with this, like what everyone else did, is, is they took the bits and pieces that they wanted to use for themselves and they ran with it. Again, we're going back to that whole shiny new thing and playing with it without a full understanding of what it really means. In the 1990s, there was more of an emphasis on, an emphasis on the fivefold ministry and functioning in the gifts of the Spirit. That led to prophecy becoming a major player in Christian circles and organizations. Everybody wanted to go to church and get a prophetic word from whoever the speaker was, or there's a word of knowledge. I mean, there's now dream interpretation schools and there's prophetic schools and all these things out there where you can get on the site. You know, I see people get on Facebook, who would like a prophetic word today? And I look at that and I'm thinking, shouldn't I be going and getting my own prophetic word? Do I need somebody else to give me that word? And I think that there's a lot of good things in all of this, but when the emphasis is put on someone else doing it for us, then we don't have any responsibility in that. So these are some of the, the, the key uh, movements that have happened, at least during my lifetime. I'm not, 
I haven't really looked a whole lot into some before that, but these are ones that I know that I saw happening before me. What we tend to do in church is the teacher or the pastor teaches a congregation, which is what we call the dump and run. It's the same thing that when you go to conferences and you have a bazillion speakers up there and they go bam, 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 and they just fire all this stuff at us. And they're like, whoa, oh, what's that? Then you have to go home and try to process it. But there's so much thrown at us that we're not necessarily able to take that information and do anything with it. So the main function from this was from earth to heaven. We'd stand there and worship and say, Father, come, 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 Holy Spirit, come and dwell among us. And I'm sitting here thinking, I thought the Holy Spirit was already here. Why are we calling him down to come and join us when he's already here? So that stuff didn't make sense to me. And then we, anyway, I'll shut up for a moment. The spiritual responsibility and the health at, in a church situation rests on the, on the leader's feet. I have a kitty who wants attention. He wants to say hi. This is Teddy. The Teddy. There's the Teddy. See, he missed me. So the spirit, spiritual responsibility and health rests at the leader's feet. So whether it's the elders or whether it's the pastor or whether it's someone else in the church, the spiritual leaders of a particular group or home fellowship or Bible study group or whatever it is, they're responsible, responsible for keeping everybody in line. That is generally how the church functions. So we answer to a hierarchical, hierarchical ah, order or progression. So minimal group participation other than worship part of the service. Most of the time you go to the service, you stand in worship, you know, however many fast songs they do, which tend to always lead into worship songs, which then sets the mood or the tone for the sermon and the offering and all of the other things that tend to come on and happen during the, the um, church service. Um, okay, Katie, I have to put you down now. He goes, I know, I missed my mom. Say hello. Okay, hi, Teddy. Um, the prophet of the apostle held the highest regard. They were supposed to train us. No, I say supposed to. When we have something that's been given to us, it's our responsibility to turn around and teach others, not just say, I'll do it for you. I remember there was a church in my area. I'm not going to say which town it was because I've lived in several towns. They practiced what was called shepherding. You couldn't do anything with your money. You couldn't do, make any life decisions without going to your home group leader who was put in charge of you. You couldn't do it. You had to get everything okay. A lot of times those churches gave a good chunk of their income to the church. And again, they called that shepherding. And there's still lots of groups, Christian as well as non-Christian groups, that practice that today. The responsibility is put on the leaders. That's my whole point. Kingdom protocol is Jesus is the head of the church, which is really the word ecclesia, not the pastor. Putting a pastor in, in charge is like going to Moses instead of directly to God. I'm sorry, but I'd rather go directly to God. Not that I don't respect the pastor, but there isn't anything that God can't tell me. I mean, why would he tell the pastor something for me when I should be finding it out for myself? Now, I understand teaching where you go and you learn things, but then it's our responsibility to take that and then do something with it. Everyone is responsible for his or her own personal growth. Unfortunately, I don't believe that that was super stressed in the church age. Developing intimacy with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a basic, basic foundation to everything. As we develop intimacy, everything else comes out of that. That's kingdom protocol, which is not necessarily what we are taught in the church age. It's Make sure you do this and make sure you do this and, you know, serve so many hours in the church and make sure that you're on the praise team or cleaning the toilets or you're doing something for the church. Everything was church focused rather than relationship focused with the father. Everyone has a part and no one person is more important than another. And that is hard for people to understand in Ecclesia 
especially the people who just want to go back there and hide and don't think they have anything to offer. Well, we all have something to offer. Each person in Ecclesia, which is kingdom protocol, is responsible for revelation. Our church habits, going into that. We tend to conference hop to get our fix so we can feel better until the next dose. It's really no different than any druggie who goes from fix to fix to fix to fix. So if we spend time going from conference to conference to conference to conference, and then we're not doing anything with that between conferences, we are basically getting our dose of drugs to get us to a point where we can feel better the next time we need to go somewhere. We rely upon leaders to help us mature. We rely on prophetic words as our guide into what we're to do and how we're to do it. I'm not negating prophetic words, but there's a lot of prophetic words that come on. I'm like, really now? <laughs> and if something doesn't make sense, you put it on the shelf. And I shared, you know, at the conference that Ian Clayton calls that Ron's file for later on. And so when you get something that doesn't make sense, you just put it in Ron's file until later on. And if it never makes sense, it just stays in that file until later on. There's so much focus on the enemy. I remember in the 80s, everybody was looking under every rock and in every corner for a demon. I'm like, um, excuse me? I, I'm sorry. I just thought that was really dumb. And I just kind of looked at people and crossed my eyes. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. But the, the question is, is, where is God in the midst of that? Isn't he more important than the demon? To me, that makes sense. Here's another thing that we were trained, you know, I mean, yes, when we were hearing from God, people always use the excuse, God told me to, whatever it is. This only works when there's agreement with all parties involved. I was married to an abuser, as I shared before, and he used to come home all the time and said, well, God told me we're supposed to do this. Or God told me we were supposed to do this. And I had always say, well, he hasn't told me that. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm the head of the house. And, and this is what God told us we're supposed to do. And there was no discussion. It was, we're doing this. I mean, I'm sorry. We were married. We were a couple. And when he did not allow me to be part of that decision, that shut everything out. So whenever you run into someone who's saying, well, God told me to do this and and God said to do this, and Holy Spirit said to do this, so we all need to do this. That is a red flag. Uh, and we were unfortunately taught to do that. I just see it and hear it so much. And again, that's why I gave the example of the marriage, because my husband used that as a controlling device to keep me in line for what he thought was best for our family. Uh, and I'm just going to leave that part there. So if you are married and you have one spouse that says, God told me to be careful of that, go back, check it out. Chances are that's probably not a God thing because if you get it and your partner does it, then it's time to reevaluate the situation. We have the inability to put into practice what we've learned in a service from week to week. Again, I just remember because I, I was on praise teams for 30 years. And I'd sit there and I'm like, people come back every week and they're the same every week. Nothing has changed. Uh, are we not listening to the sermon on Sunday morning? And we'd talk about it in praise practice. And as a team, we'd say, what can we do to help bring people in? Well, number one, that was our biggest problem. We don't need to bring people into worship. We do what we're supposed to do. And if the people follow, great. If they don't, that's not our problem. We can't force people to do something that they're not practicing outside of the area. For example, church. I can't hit you over the head with the Bible and say, you need to do this. Number one, that's control. And number two, that takes the responsibility away from that person to deal with it themselves. We take for granted what's spoken as the final word rather than seeking it out on our own. I'm amazed at how stupid Christianity is at times because someone will get up there and they'll just make this blanket statement where I'll like, wow. And I've even heard, you know, Ian and 
Ian Clayton and Mike Parsons and a lot of these, Dr. O and these people, they say, go find out for yourself. Get your own revelation. What I give you is a starting point because we're so used to someone saying this is how it is, we just assume that that's what we're supposed to do. But, and as I said, God is going to talk to me in depth. He is going to talk to every one of you in your own language, and he's going to show us each something different about a certain topic so that we understand it through our language and through our terms what he's trying to say to us. We quickly take a new thing and run with it before understanding the consequences of our actions. And I think a really good example of that was the whole deliverance ministry. People just assume, oh, we got to get rid of all these demons. We've got to get all these people's delivered. Da, 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 da. And I think some of that actually caused more damage than it helped. Again, there was a lack of understanding of what that really did for people. I mean, yes, it works because, you know, when things work, kids and we're just learning to do something, that stuff works. But at some point, there's more. And again, also, that was done from earth to heaven rather than heaven to earth. I'm not going to go into all that. So functioning as a son of God, a son has a personal re relationship with the father. That only happens when we spend time together. The Trinity is not there to vomit our requests onto we are to get to know them just like we do any best friend. If I went to my best friend every day and said, oh, I just can't seem to get through this. Will you please help me? If you did that every day and that's all you ever did with your best friend, you wouldn't have a best, best friend very long because they would get tired of that and say, I'm out of here. I mean, thank, thankfully, God does not do that to us. But he wants us to get to know him and to share his heart with us so that we can see people as he sees them. That was revelation for me the first time I really understood that. <laughs> I'm like, oh man. A son understands that maturity and character building is part of the process. If we understand that we're going to go through trials and that life is flat out going to suck at times, and then we just have to learn to deal and function in that place of rest on the top of our mountain, things go a lot easier, which you heard me share earlier this week with the whole eminent domain process. I mean, I, as I said, that was probably the most difficult year of my life in as long as I can remember, and in some ways even more difficult than the abuse of marriage. Number one, it lasted longer. And the other thing is, there was so much of it that was out of my control. And, you know, we like to control things. So as we walk through maturity, we get to build our character. Woohoo! they all say. Everything is done from heaven to earth, which is backwards of what we've been taught. And we'll get into more of that later. We all have personal character flaws. We've all had traumas. We need healing of some sort. None of us are perfect. If we were, we'd be like Jesus. We wouldn't be sick. We wouldn't be frustrated. We wouldn't have the issues that we have if we didn't have any character flaws. So until we deal with what holds us back, we don't understand our identity in Christ. And I, talk about, I talked about this in the earlier session, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over this. When we understand our identity and don't allow those things that come at us to try to rip our identity away from us to take root and the little familiars to whisper in their ears, they whisper, speak nothing into our ear. When we stop doing that and just look at Christ, remember how he said, he grabbed me by the face and said, Who do you, what do you see? And I'm like, I see you. Well, then keep looking there. When that's our focus, all of this other stuff takes on a whole new perspective because then we see things through the eyes of Jesus. So when we understand our identity in Christ, we move into newer levels of maturity. This propels us into new responsibility. We don't hold on to what we learn. We're to teach others so we can move on to the next thing we're supposed to do. And a lot of people think, well, if I teach someone how to be a prophet, and they get to be more prophetic than I am, then I'm not going to be able to make any money, or I'm, you know, you know what? 
God has something new for us. So hopefully in what I'm doing, I can show other people how to do what I'm doing. And then they're all out there creating all this cool music and they're out there using the, the frequencies of Hebrew letters and they're out there doing all this stuff. Great. Then God's going to have me move on to something else. And I think that we forget to look at that at times. So we'll let that fly off. In the next move of God, we must mature. Each new move comes with experimenting, as I said before. At some point, we need to get past the milk of the word and begin to function in a higher pay grade. We always think the milk of the word is the understanding of the Bible itself. But I think the milk of the word is more than that. And it's an understanding of how to function as a son. In most previous moves of God, people have functioned at the second or third grade level of maturity, which is why we struggle with going from one to the next. It's like in the, when the speaking in tongues, oh, you can't speak in tongues, that's of the devil. Uh, and then once we did that, we get the prophetic movement. Oh, we can't have prophecy because prophecies passed away. And, you know, I remember the time when rock music became really prominent. No, we can't have rock music in church. Drums are of the devil. No electric guitars in church. And I'm sitting there, oh, bro. I'm just, you know, I kept my mouth shut through most of that because I'm thinking we get stuck in whatever we're doing and don't see how God is in and just adding to, putting layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And we do those things. We get stuck at the seventh, second or third grade level of maturity. When we expect someone else to be responsible for our spiritual growth, we only function at an elementary level of maturity. When we're constantly running to the prayer line, or when we're constantly running to get the next greatest prophetic word, or we expect someone to teach us something so that we can do something, we're at an elementary level of maturity. If we don't mature beyond the elementary level, we'll miss what God is doing next, as I just demonstrated in all these movements. People really struggled with moving from one to the next to the next to the next and just adding upon what they already knew. I think, again, that's typical, typical in life because we get so comfortable in how we live our lives and what we're doing that we just like, I don't want to do that. This new move doesn't negate what we've done previously. It fulfills it. As I just said a minute ago, I got ahead of myself. If we don't want to be left behind in the now of how and where God is moving, we have to deal with personal issues and religious paradigms that can hold us back. Failure to do so means we stay at the elementary level. So just think of maturing as a son of God as if we are in school. Kindergarten, first grade, second, third, fifth, all the way up to college. In order to get to college level of maturity and in kingdom, we have to be at the point where we're not nitpicking at things and where we're not playing around with things and we have an understanding of how each of these moves work and we understand the responsibility with what we're, with what we're doing in those moves. So what is a pay grade? This term was coined by Ian Clayton. I loved it when he said it because it totally made sense. I mean, I'm a teacher, so... We liken spiritual maturity to attending school. As I just said before, you move from kindergarten to sixth grade and all the grades in between up to college. And when we skip grade levels, we miss many key factors. You would never take a person who's just finished first grade and then the next year they go to sixth grade. You just wouldn't do that because they would get left behind. The kids would start misbehaving. They would start doing really dumb things. You would lose focus. Then you would think, oh, there's something wrong with this kid. No, you've put them in a grade level that they're not ready for yet. And the same thing happens in Kingdom Protocol. When we start doing things beyond our pay grade, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. Not dealing with our junk always holds us back. And that includes, you know, there's a pay grade for dealing with our junk and for personal maturity. Those in a higher grade pay grade, much like a parent, end up cleaning up our messes. And the example I use at the gathering is if you let a two-year-old loose in a kitchen and you gave them some flour and said, hey, would you like to do some paper mache right now? A two-year-old. What are you, 
you, I know you, every one of you has already got a picture in your mind of what you're going to see if you walk into that kitchen in 10 minutes. There's going to be flour absolutely everywhere. It'll be a huge mess. There's flour all over the child, flour all over the floor, the table, the counters, the walls, and it takes you about 10 hours to clean up that mess. That's what happens when we function in our pay grade, when we do things with, when we play around with things that we have no business playing around with. Here's the other thing. We can be in different grade levels for different subjects. For example, math, science, music. I remember that when I was in grade school, some kids would get moved up to the next grade for math, that they would stay in our class for science, or they would go to English into another class, or they would move people around. And you see it more and more now in, in the public school system kids are, are moving around at different grade levels depending on what their expertise is in different subject matter. Now in band, because I was in band, you could audition for the, the top band when you were a sophomore in high school, but very few people ever made the top band and ended up staying in the bottom band until they were at a playing level where they could handle the music that was in the symphonic bands. So again, put this in with Kingdom Protocol. So just like a two-year-old, we can make messes and understand what we've done. As we mature, we should end up being at the same grade level in all Kingdom subjects. That means math, science, PE, whatever all the subjects are. You know, eventually we all become six, we become sixth grade level, then we become seventh grade level. But what often happens is, is our emotions or our traumas and those things are down at pay grade one and two or first and second grade while our head knowledge and other things might be at the sixth grade level but we've got one that's so far down here and the other that's so far up here i mean for a while it's going to function but then as we try to move from the sixth to the seventh grade and this stuff is still down at kindergarten or first grade eventually that's going to pull this back down and and, and the walls fall and the, the found because the foundation isn't set for that to function. The biggest area that I've seen this in lately, or in the well, last few years is, oh, it's go to courts. Let's take that to court. Let's go deal with that in court. And people get uh, into trouble because they're taking things and doing things in the courts that they have no business doing. Now, at first it seems like it works because again, this is where the grace of God comes in. And it also works because someone who's more mature can see in the spirit and goes, I got to go clean that up. And we don't even realize it. We think that we did something great, but really what happened is that someone more mature came along and cleaned it up. If we fail to mature in all kingdom subject areas, lack of maturity in one area spills over and affects maturity in another, which I already said. I got ahead of myself again. So how do we deal with our junk? Get the Ian Clayton's book, The Gateways to Threefold Nature of Man. It's available in people. Available in PDF form on his website, which is sonofthunder.org. I didn't put that link in here, but I put it all over the place, so you should be able to find it. Again, sonofthunder.org. You can get the book on Amazon, too. Sign up for Mike Parsons' Engaging God program. It's a self-propelled program, and the whole first module is doing nothing but dealing with your stuff. And then that takes you, um, oh, I didn't list the other one. The mobile court, I'll get to that other one in a minute. The mobile court, which is the court of accusations, is meant for dealing with personal and ancestral issues. You'll spend a lot of time there in the process of dealing with personal things. As we clean up our stuff, this propels us into greater levels of maturity. So then you've got that sixth grade. Let's say you're functioning at the sixth grade level in the courts. I mean, again, I'm just pointing that one because that seems to be really popular right now. And... But you've you're, you're got all these traumas and you've got all these other things in your life that are at pay grade one, first grade level. And you try to move to seventh grade up here, but you're still having all this stuff here. Then it's going to pull that down because this needs to be at a higher grade level in order for this to work. But let's say we get the healing, deal with some of our traumas, whatever things are causing us. And we bring that up into the sixth grade level, the same as this, or even fifth or sixth, and this might be seventh. Then all of a sudden, that just propels us into that next level of maturity. So if we keep getting stuck, that's a good way of knowing that there's some work that needs to be done. 
So dealing with their issues and junk in our lives also helps us understand their identity in Christ. Without that understanding, we're spiritually stunted. And I say this for myself, as I shared before, I was in a very abusive marriage. And during that time, everything about me just kind of stopped. I got stunted. And in fact, I probably went back a few steps. And I got, it was frustrating because I had, I came into that marriage really thinking I was understanding who I was in Christ. But obviously I wasn't completely there because there were issues. <laughs> I had a hard time not believing his lies. And because I did believe those lies, that put me into some places that I didn't want to be physically as well as emotionally. And it took me about 13 years after I left the marriage to pull my head out, for lack of a better term. And I, as I shared before, my best friend said to me, you had a part in that abusive marriage. And that, that frosted my buttons. That made me mad. How could I have a part in that? And then the Holy Spirit said to me, it took about two years before I was willing to listen to what she said. He said, you believe the lies. And because you believed those lies, that stunted you. So until I was willing to deal with, deal with that stuff, I didn't get unstuck. Now I've learned, woohoo, time to repent, woohoo. And that excites me because I know that I can deal with stuff and then I'm done. That rocks. It takes patience, practice, and perseverance to change our thought processes and paradigms. And learning to live as a son, much like practicing a musical instrument. And I talked about how every one of my students, they walk into my studio every fall, and I'm like, okay, you have to play all of your scales and all of your arpeggios for me as part of your grade at the end of the semester. And they all look at me like, okay. And like, if you don't start practicing this now, you're going to be toast. Because you don't just throw this stuff together two days before the final exam and think that you're going to play it. It doesn't, that's not how it works. Because we have to exercise our spiritual muscles much like a workout session. You don't go into the gym and go five pounds one day, 10 pounds the next, 20 pounds the next day. You don't jump around between weights because the whole point is, is to build muscle tone and muscle memory. We have to look at all of our spiritual increasing knowledge and working through our traumas is very similar to a workout session or practicing an instrument. It's slow, methodical practice. And where we really mess up is as we live in what we call a microwave society. Got to have it right now. If I can't do this after two weeks, I'm never going to be able to do it. And you would not believe how many people I've heard say that. Crushing that belief, the importance of trials. Without trials and tests, we don't graduate to the next grade level. Our test score in each trial determines how and when we move to the next level. Remember, we're in kingdom school. We are in school to learn to work through the junk in our lives. If similar situations keep recurring, that's a clue we're retaking a test. So if you keep going around the mulberry bush, as I said a few times, and it just keeps happening and happening again and again, you deal with rejection issues your entire life, which is something I dealt with, so I know, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, wore it. It wasn't until I realized, why does this keep happening to me? If this, why does it keep happening to me, keeps coming up, there's something that needs to be taken care of. But... Ding, 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 ding. The cool thing is repentance or turning away from something is a resetting. It's not, it's nothing more than that. Even if we didn't do something, someone in our ancestral line probably did. And I think that's where we get, well, why should I accept the accusation for that? I didn't do that. We live out the issues of our ancestral lines too. What, what we call that 97% junk DNA has the memory of all of our ancestors carried in it. We call that epigenetics. I mean, you heard of heart transplant victims and kidney transplant. And, you know, I did a whole research on this. And some lady woke up one day in the hospital after a kidney transplant. And she goes, I've got to have a hamburger and fries. And her husband looked at her and goes, why do you want that? You don't even like hamburger and fries. I don't know, but I just have this 
amazing craving for hamburger and fries and to find out her the donor was that was his favorite food so you can't tell me that that woman wasn't carrying the memory of something that was in that kidney i think it was a kidney it, you know with some vital organ so i mean in that case if that person was carrying the memory of the dead person's kidney in their body just imagine how we carry everything that's been in our ancestral line every trauma every memory everything so i've just learned hey you know i have no idea why i would be why this accusation is coming but i accept it because i know the second that i accept it i repent i renounce ties to it i nail it to the cross i cover it with the blood of jesus and i hand it to him and trade for something else that takes the responsibility off of me and puts it back on the enemy as far as i'm concerned he can have it. So when we redeem stuff our ancestors left behind or repent for their issues, it's brought forward into us. We then walk into a new freedom. And that's the best part. So get the book, Access to Your Spiritual Inheritance by Alice Briggs, Seneca Sherbin, and myself. We each had a different way of doing this, but we were having experiences at the same time, which is why we decided to make this a joint venture. Alice first saw this door in the spirit with all these things, you know, completely boarded up, hate, frustration, and all, and then she, one by one, the Lord had her take all of these, these boards down. And then she goes through this door and starts reclaiming all these amazing things that were left by her ancestors. And I share a couple of those stories in my book, Accessing the Kingdom Realms, where I went in into the musical instrument room of heaven and there was a drum set on the bottom shelf in under under the musical instrument section from my family and he said i want you to redeem that for your brother and so i did in the spirit in my imagination i took that and i just by faith went and released it back to him that was something that was shut down because of religious thinking we don't i you know still don't know how that affected him i may never know but by faith we do things and then you start seeing changes how do we know if we've matured? As we move through life's trials, old triggers pass away. I realize things that triggered me last week or last year or two years ago, when it happens again, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That didn't piss me off like it used to. Wait a minute. That doesn't bother me anymore. And sometimes we don't know these things until people we know tell us. So that's another barometer. Ask, ask people. If what triggered us yesterday doesn't have the same effect, we've matured. Journaling helps us see where we were in the past. It's a great maturity barometer, I call. I mean, I was reading through my journals the other day looking for stuff for this book that we're writing on the Hebrew letter frequencies. And I ran across some things and I'm like, wow, I didn't remember that. I mean, that's why you journal so that you can go back and step into the experiencing and then take off where you left. And there's a lot of times I'm in there and I'm like discussing with Father, I don't know why, but this is really frustrating me. I don't know what to do, you know, because I whined, I did my share of whining, you know. I'd like some cheese with that wine. And then I, I see the progression of, as I was reading through these things, how I didn't deal with things the same way. I didn't go to the Father the same way and complain like I did at first. And so I could see in my writing how the maturity had happened. So that's another reason why I think journaling is important. The other thing is we have more peace and joy in our lives. I went to a conference in the summer of 2018 that I hadn't been in two years. And the person running it said, wow, there's so much peace and joy over you. I've never seen that much on you. And kept asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? So when other people start seeing it in us, we know we've matured. If you don't know, ask. And if you don't get an answer that you like, then that just means there's more work. But you know what? We all have work to go. It's just a lifelong pursuit. We begin to understand God's love and see how he sees others despite how they may act. This took a lot, especially in my marriage, because he was acting like a total dork most of the time. And I, God had to show me I love him just as much as I love you. I don't love you any more than I love him because he is my creation 
just as much as you are. And that wasn't necessarily happening during the marriage, but it was afterwards. And so I look at him or try to look at him or see him through the eyes of the father and how much he loves him and how much he pl his plans are for him. Now, whether he chooses to do that and step in that, that's up to him. But I can at least see him as the father sees him, which gives me more compassion for him in his situation. We also see a change and a shift in our paradigms. We let go of religious thinking that holds us back. We learn to see things from a kingdom perspective and begin to function kingdom first rather than our usual earth first ideas and in manners. The enemy no longer matters. I could really care less what the enemy does. I so love it when I read the story of Smith Wigglesworth when he was sleeping and he heard something that sounded as bad, the fit of his bed, and he turned around and he looked and it was the devil standing there and he goes, oh, it's just you, and went back to sleep. I think that's awesome and that's how we should look at the enemy. Don't give him any more attention than that. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, you know, the only time we have to deal with the enemy is in court and, you know, send him off to where he's supposed to go. That's the best way. Our eyes are pinned on Jesus despite our situation where we can stay in that place of rest in him. And as I said before, in this last year of the imminent domain situation, my entire life was completely turned upside down. Everything that I had, nothing was the same, job changes, everything was changed. And I had to learn to stay at rest in him, in the middle of me, not knowing where I was going to live, how much money I was going to make me making. I, none of that stuff. I had to learn to be at rest. And so as we're able to do that, we know we've matured. So moving forward, if we don't learn to deal with our personal issues, we're held back a pay grade or more. That's a reiterated. If we don't learn to be personally responsible for our own spiritual growth, we'll get left behind because we expect someone else to lead us. There's a certain point, just like a two-year-old or four-year-old or five-year-old, where you continue training them, but they have more and more and more responsibility as they get older. It works the same way in the spirit. But you can't have someone holding your little hand all the way through college, spiritual college. If our focus isn't on development, developing intimacy with the Trinity, we'll spend way too much time playing with bright and new shiny things or the latest and greatest revelation. Get out of the I need a pastor mentality for spiritual growth. Live out of God's love. As we entrain and entangle with who he is, we demonstrate his love and will begin to have experiences as described by Nancy Cohen. She said that she would walk into a room with a hundred Muslims and then all she would do is just ponder and just say, Father, you love them so much. They would see her as this bright light and they would fall down on their faces and say, what must I do to get saved? When we resonate his love, we don't have to say anything. I'm looking forward to being, to functioning like that. So we seek and find using our God-given imagination and ability to think for ourselves. That's so important. We can't let someone else think for us because God's not going to talk to you the same way he's going to talk to me. Now, yes, we compare it with you know, the principles that are outlined in scripture to make sure that we're not doing something stupid. But, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't in the Bible. Cars aren't in the Bible. Cell phones aren't in the Bible. TVs aren't in the Bible, but we're still using them. So we have to get out of that with the Bible thing. You're looking at the, the overall, is this a God character type of thing? Would this be how, God, is this God's love? We're looking at those kinds of things to make sure that we're in line. When we see or receive things, feathers, gemstones, all those kinds of things, we are to ask God what he's doing in that instead of, oh, can we have more gemstones? Oh, I want to see more glitter. Oh, can we, maybe if we go and we worship long enough, we'll get more feathers to fall tomorrow night. All right. My question is, okay, those feathers are falling. What are you saying to me in those in allowing those feathers to fall. And we forget to do that. We get so excited about all those cool things, we forget to ask the why question. See what we have as part of a larger picture and how we fit into that picture. 
And this is where we move into Ecclesia. As of 2012, noted by many, I think Ian Clayton was the first to say this, that, we are, that I heard say it, I've heard others say it since then, that we're coming out of the church age. We're also moving from the age of Melchizedek into the age of rest. That doesn't mean that what was in the church age isn't useful or in the age of Melchizedek or, are not useful. That means we just step and add more revelation and more onto what we're doing, as I explained earlier. Each age comes with more responsibility and maturity. Ecclesia actually started at the time of the disciples, and we've left it for Constantine's church model. So we have a little bit of catching up to do in that area. Ecclesia functions as a well-oiled machine. Ecclesia fosters personal responsibility and maturity. Each person becomes responsible for adding to the Ecclesia's revelation. As we function in Ecclesia, it's easier to move on to the next ages yet to come. So basically, and before I do the resources, what I'm seeing is in, in order for this next move of God, if we don't deal with our gateways, if we don't deal with the junk in our lives, if we don't get past the point of having someone else hold our hands while we move from the thing to thing to thing, if we don't take responsibility for our, our own actions, and if we don't take responsibility for our, our own maturity, we're not going to be able to function in the next move of God. And those people who are ready for it will just move on. And we'll be stuck in whatever age it is right now. The church age is, there's a lot of people that are stuck there. And that's okay. If that's where they want to be, that's fine. But if we really want to be in the next move of God, it's really important to deal with the things that hold us back. Any place in our life where we're in first grade here and fourth grade here and ninth grade here, we need to bring that up so that we're all at the same level so that we can mature into the next age. And I used also the example of this at the gathering that all the time growing up, I was told you have great technique, you can move your fingers really well on the clarinet, but you have no feeling, which in, in classical music terms, we call that playing musically. I was always told that there was no emotion or feeling in my playing. And different professors tried to do different things and whatever. I, you know, I don't know what it was in that that seemed to hold me back, but I was also more interested in, ooh, how fast can I do this? And give me the fastest and the greatest piece. I mean, I think it was because that's what I liked doing. And it wasn't until I started playing Brahms, which is just all extremely emotional and some Mozart stuff and some things that required some really heavy duty, just nuances in the music that I started bringing that level of maturity and musicianship up to match my technique. Um, so it's the same way when it comes to spiritual things. As we look at all the different levels of maturity that we have in our lives, if we want to function in this new move of God, we must deal with our junk. We must see what it is that's holding us back so that we can bring that into greater level of maturity so that we can function and function well in this next move. So resources to help. Mike Parsons has the Mentoring Through Engaging God program. I believe the website is eg.freedomart.com. It's only something like $15, $16 a month. And you have access to it for as long as you pay the money to do it. Wonderful materials. The Nest is a Kingdom Training School. It's a three-year program. The Foundation Nest, I believe, is what it is. I hope that's the right website. If I find out that it's not, I'll make sure I change it in the PDF before it sends to people. Again, what it does is it goes through Kingdom Protocol, and the whole first two years are spent with dealing with our junk. We spent the whole second year of the nest working on our gateways. I've had over 50 years of my life to mess it up. I'm not going to fix it in three or four years. And once we do the major gateway work, it's like cleaning house, 
major spring cleaning, spring, summer, winter, fall cleaning all at one time over three or four years, and then you do maintenance from that point on. And the nest is really good with introducing kingdom protocol and functioning as a kingdom or a spirit being as well as dealing with all the stuff that holds us back. Both these programs spend a good time of dealing with personal issues and getting rid of our junk. I just said that. Northwest Ecclesia has mentoring sessions. So for more information, visit uh, www.nwecclesia.com. Uh, these mentoring sessions include working with Ecclesia itself and helping you put together an Ecclesia. But by the time you have listened to this conference, you should have enough material to go start an Ecclesia yourself. And again, it should just be organic. But if you want help, you sign up for that Ecclesia class. There's other ones, you know, there, there's the gateways, mountains and trading floors. That one is a standard one every year and others change depending on who is in the Ecclesia. I know I'm offering the Frequency Basics one. That is just more for fun and understanding how frequency affects everything around us. Supernatural Lessons is one of my websites where I have practice teachings and other helpful activations to help you on your journey. There are many opportunities for healing sessions with people in both, both Northwest Ecclesia and on Kingdom Tribes. It's just, as it sounds, kingdomtribes.com. Uh, lots of opportunity for people to grow and to learn in those places. There are several organizations that use Kingdom Tribes. Freedom Flowers, this is Seneca, and she carries some flower and music essences that are supposed to help with emotional issues that come up during our healing process. Wonderful stuff. And then, of course, my website, Healing Frequencies Music, has music to bring a sense of calm and peace into your life. I also have EMDR music, which is the bilateral music that pans right to left. It mimics rapid eye movement, which is where we deal with the process, the traumas of our daily life. And then so when you listen to EMDR music, that is basically functioning like when you're in REM sleep. Uh, I think that's... Ooh, there's one more. Alice Briggs offers emotional healing through Splontna as well as other methods, emotionalandspiritualhealing.com. She's usually at the gathering, but she was not this year. And she will do sessions via Zoom or Skype. And wonderful person to work with. And I believe that's it, so I'm going to stop sharing so you can see my cute face again. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> uh, so I think I pretty much hit everything that I talked about at the, my last session of the gathering. Again, I just cannot reiterate enough. If we want to function fully in this new move of God, it's really important that we have the willingness to deal with the personal issues in our lives that are holding us back from moving forward. We, we want by now, we want to be at that college level in kingdom maturity because this new move isn't going to be able to handle elementary, junior high, or even high school level knowledge to function as a son of God. This is at so much of a higher level than we've ever experienced before. I feel like I'm catching up and I'm like, I, when I talk with people, they're always like, I have so much, I'm not sure I can get this all done. And I love what Ian says, just get on the journey. If we get on the journey and we're constantly moving forward, we're not going to be left behind. And I was so happy to hear him say that. But if we're unwilling to deal with things when they come up, that's where, we're, where we get stunted. And that's hard, especially when we've been through so many traumas. So many things in our lives have happened. I mean, every one of us have had major things that, that have not been fun to us. And as we work through those things, it's amazing how free we can become in who we are as a son of God. And when I'm saying son of God, I, it's gender neutral. There is no man or woman in Christ. Son of God, that's referring to humanity. So please don't be offended by that. And as I say, taking an offense is a choice. 
So if we choose not to be offended, there's much more things I would rather spend my time on than be offended. It seems to be really prominent in our society these days. I'm like, okay, can we just get a grip? <laughs> anyway, on that note, I think I've said everything I said in, in my last session. And if you have any questions, you can email us at Northwest Ecclesia. You can go on to any of my websites and go into the contact us and send me a, a, an email personally. Uh, so we hope to hear from you. And thank you for being at the conference. And for those people who are getting this later, I hope you enjoy everything that was at the conference. And we'll talk to you later. Bye.